Thanks again for the opportunity to speak here. Um, uh, really enjoyed my, my time so far. It's been a lot of fun uh, interacting with grad students and faculty here. Um, today's talk's going to be a little bit different from yesterday's, but I, it'll still have some similar flavors. So I'm going to start off by uh, giving an introduction to two of the methods that are commonly used to estimate habitat selection or to model habitat selection in the wildlife literature. They're not the only two approaches, but they're two of the most common approaches. Resource selection functions and step selection functions. Um, I'll try to pro provide some motivation for why we might care about modeling among animal variability in their habitat selection parameter, uh, habitat selection patterns. And then talk about two general ways that we might consider doing that. So a two-stage approach and a mixed effects approach. And hopefully this last part, even if you're not really interested in, in, in habitat selection, it'll still be of interest because these general sort of approaches may apply, will apply to many different types of, of data and questions and things like that. Okay, so to begin with, just um, a general overview of what are we trying to do with habitat selection studies. There's a lot of jargon out, of the, out in the literature, a lot of different approaches um, that are used to answer these sort of questions, but I'd like to boil it down to we're trying to model the spatial distribution of locations as a function of three different types of predictors. So resources where generally you think about wanting to have more, more is better, risks where less is better, and then there are some sort of things like temperature and pH where maybe you think of them as conditions, environmental conditions where you want some middle ground, too hot, too cold is not really um, great for you, but you want some middle ground. And the goals are to try and identify important drivers of habitat selection and species distributions, and ideally to be able to predict habitat use or species distributions in novel environments, or to understand what will happen if the environment changes. We might also be interested in trying to think about, well, what, how do we quantify importance to um, an individual? And we might do, think about that in real simplistic terms, in terms of habitat selection or habitat preference. And one simple way that this can be done, and this is an example going back to the 1970s where um, these individuals flew a large area in Minnesota and quantified habitat in terms of four different habitat types, so whether areas were burned or not and how close they were to the burn, um, measured the proportion of the landscape that was in each of those different habitat types here, and then counted the number of moose that were in those different habitat types. So you've got a measure of habitat use, you've got some measure of availability of these different habitat types on the landscape, and then one simple measure of habitat preference might be just comparing the amount of uh, use of these habitats relative to their availability. So that'd be these selection ratios, and something greater than one would say that the animals are using this habitat type um, in greater proportion than it's available on the landscape. That would be something that would be indicative of an important um, type of, of, of habitat. Resource selection functions sort of generalize this idea, but to allow, um, allow you to think about incorporating predictors that capture environmental characteristics using both um, categorical variables and quantitative variables. So we can think about these mountain goats and we might think about the ruggedness of the terrain, maybe the elevation, things like that being really important for escape cover. And we might go out and put collars on these individuals and get locations um, in some broader study area. Um, and we may quantify characteristics of those locations. So again, things like um, elevation or the, the terrain cover. And then we could think about, well, there's other areas close by that these individuals could use. We could think about the habitats that are available to those animals and quantify those same sort of environmental conditions and co contrast them to try and understand um, why are the individual, individuals up here and not in these other areas. And this is most often done with logistic regression, but there's lots of other approaches in the species distribution model, modeling literature, thinking about uh, applying similar sorts of methods to plants. Oftentimes people use something like Maxent. Bottom line is they're really doing very similar things. They're comparing used locations and available locations. For logistic regression, what's typically done is the used locations are treated as ones. Those are places you've seen the animal. 
Um, the places that are generated as available locations are treated as zeros. And then we have our predictors and we estimate regression parameters. There's a whole um, body of literature trying to understand is logistic, ac logistic regression actually appropriate in this context? Um, when I used to teach these methods, I would try and go through that history um, of all the debate in the literature. And I'd see, I finally realized I was just confusing people to just try and unconfuse them. And so now I would just argue that this is a very reasonable approach. Um, there are ways to make it a little more reasonable, for example, like weighting your available points, giving them a higher weight, or making sure you've generated enough available points that you really capture the background location. But this is, this is a popular approach. And in the end, um, the key summary is this resource selection function, which essentially we're taking a weighted combination of these different predictor variables. And we're trying to measure sort of um, habitat suitability or what's, what's, what's sort of a relative index of um, habitat suitability. And one of the things you'll notice is that the intercept, we usually just ignore that. If you think about that in a logistic regression model, that intercept's really going to be heavily influenced by how many available points you generate. So it's not something that's really biologically interesting here. And really, when you think about how the best ways are to interpret this approach, um, in the last, say, six or seven years, there's been a lot of work that's connected it to um, the statistical literature on modeling point spatial point patterns. And so this whole approach can be seen as being consistent with modeling um, the locations as what's called an inhomogeneous Poisson point process model. And if you look at the literature, there's a lot of um, work that really is tying together all these different approaches that people use for modeling habitat selection under this common umbrella of a spatial point process. Um, again, the important piece is thinking about we're modeling those spatial locations as a function of those different predictors. And one of the things we might end up doing is just taking that resource selection function and just um, reweighting it so that it integrates or sums to one on the landscape. So you could think about that as um, the relative probability of finding an individual in any sort of spatial location. Again, if you thought about the intercept, it would drop out here because it would be in both the numerator and denominator. So again, if you're going to use logistic regression, typically that intercept is not super important. That will be important um, to consider when we think about mixed effect models in this sort of um, situation. So keep that in mind. Some of, the, some of the potential issues here, particularly if our data are telemetry data, we're, we're following individuals over time. These methods are essentially assuming that all locations are independent, both within an individual and across individuals. And we know that, especially with things like GPS data, where we're getting locations every 10 or 15 minutes, observations that are close in time are also going to be close in space. And so this assumption of independence is not very realistic. Um, another way to think about this is that that whole outer contour where we're generating, say, av available points, we could think about that availability background as being relevant at each location, where we know that's not um, biologically a, a very realistic model in terms of an animal can't get anywhere in that greater landscape in 15 minutes, say, if we have 15-minute if we're collecting locations every 15 minutes, an individual is not going to be able to get throughout its whole, say, home range or some larger study area within 15 minutes. So these are some potential issues that led um, Daniel Fortin and some others to develop this idea of a step selection function. So, so essentially, the idea was to still try and contrast used points and available points, but now to think about available points as being conditioned on the previous location. So we can think about generating available points by thinking about how an animal moves um, and how far it might move in the time between two successive locations. So we can, in essence, relax that independence assumption a little bit. Instead of thinking of our locations as being independent, we can think of transitions between locations as being independent. So we have independent steps between locations um, in this case. Visually, I think it's nice to sort of visualize this pattern. We have essentially a discrete time movement model where we can think of an individual um, moving between different locations that we observe. And we can capture that 
trajectory in terms of uh, step length, so the distance between locations, and then turn angles, which is essentially a deviation from the previous direction. So here you can see the individual is moving here. Our turn angle would be this difference between the direction it was heading um, relative, to, and then here's the direction that it actually headed um, to meet that next location. So we can think about these transitions now in terms of a step length and a turn angle. And then we think of the used locations that we see as being dependent both on how an individual will move, um, if it was in a homogeneous landscape, or if it didn't prefer any different, it di didn't have any sort of habitat preference, um, this sort of independent, habitat independent movement multiplied by a habitat selection kernel. So you have kind of two pieces here in these sorts of models. You've got one that describes general movements, and then you've got a second piece that um, weights the habitat that the animal could get to in terms of um, these environmental characteristics that might be important to the animal. There's lots of ways for generating available locations. So in that original paper, what the authors did was just take observed movements and resample them with replacement. So essentially using a bootstrap to generate um, new step lengths and turn angles. One benefit of that is that um, we'd expect step lengths and turn angles to be correlated. So if I'm moving in a very directed manner, um, I'm going to be taking long steps and I'm probably not going to be turning very much. Whereas if I'm foraging, I'm going to take small steps and I might be turning quite a bit, right? So turn angles and step lengths may not be independent. Um, and currently, most of the approaches um, that use statistical distributions to, to describe step lengths and turn angles, they assume those things are independent. A downside to the bootstrapping approach, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I do when we teach workshops, but I can just point you to Tal and Tal's 2016 paper is that when we just resample movements and we think about this model, we're thinking about there's two things that contribute to the movements we see. One is kind of this underlying movement characteristics of the individual, and the other is this habitat selection piece. And what we ultimately like to do is parameterize the movement piece without thinking about the habitat selection piece. But we haven't really done this here if we bootstrap our data. We're really seeing the com combined effect of those two different processes. Um, and so essentially, the bootstrapping can introduce a little bit of bias in your um, habitat selection parameters. This, this goes back to a nice paper by James Forrester in 2009, and Tal, Tal has um, built on that. Um, so actually, what most people, I'd say, do now is that they will parameterize statistical distributions that describe step lengths and turn angles, and then generate data from those statistical distributions. And then once you have available points, we can analyze da the data using conditional logistic regression. And this differs a little bit from logistic regression in that it recognizes that each used location is matched to a different set of available locations. So now those contrasts between used and available locations, they're done um, on using tempor temporally varying available availability um, sets of data. Okay, so this will recognize that structure in the data. There's actually a really elegant theory that supports this idea um, and work that's been shown that this, this can be equivalent to um, estimating and fitting a, a, a model of biased correlated random walks. Um, I mentioned this little bit about the potential bias that can incur when parameterizing the movement piece without thinking about the habitat piece. With certain statistical distributions, you can actually correct for that bias, and that's um, in this paper by Tal in 2016, and this one up here in 2015. Really interesting statistical work, in my, my opinion. Um, and the other real advantage of this is it opens the door to thinking about not just habitat selection, but thinking about using data to model both movement and habitat selection at the same time. So there are things that you can do. You can, say, interact 
um, step lengths or log step lengths with habitat characteristics to say when I'm in open habitat, I'm moving much farther distances, right? So I'm trying to get out of open space to get to forest. Um, you can have um, angular deviations between locations and landscape characteristics to say, um, I'm moving in a di direction with a long-term um, goal of trying to make it to, to the ski resort. So I'm kind of moving in a certain direction, but if I see like a really nice restaurant or a coffee shop along the way, I might be, uh, I might move off that path, I'm not gonna move directed, but I've got this long-term goal. So my, my steps are gonna be biased in a certain direction. Um, you can include deviations between locations and the direction you are walking in. So you can allow for things like directional persistence, um, which will capture features in real movements where uh, individuals don't just move with random turn angles. They tend to move in the same direction, especially when data are collected at fine time scales. So it's a really neat, interesting, and exciting sort of approach. Um, it's a little bit harder than the traditional resource selection function approach in that you have to be able to generate data, uh, fit, fit um, these statistical distributions to your data and generate data. Um, and if you want to correct for those biases, it's a little more involved. Tal and I have worked with Johanna Signer, who's in, in Germany and has a great computational skill set. Um, Johannes has developed this really nice um, R package that makes this really quite easy. Um, it's called AMT for Animal Movement Tools. Um, it'll actually parameterize those statistical distributions for you. It will generate random points for you quite easily. It'll correct for these biases that I mentioned before. And then from fitted models, it'll actually simulate movement data, which is actually really quite cool. So you can, you can generate movements from your fitted models. So in summary, these two approaches, they share some similarities in that we're trying to characterize the importance of, of different environmental characteristics um, and, and what's driving habitat use. Resource selection functions, they have different scales. So typically resource selection functions are applied to understand um, how animals are using habitat within their home range. It doesn't have to be applied at that scale, but that's probably the most common scale. Whereas step selection functions, we're thinking about how um, the environment's influencing our decisions at a much more local movement scale. Although we can still have, like I said, directional biases that, that have longer term implications. Um, resource selection functions assume locations are independent. Step selection functions assume that these transitions are independent. For resource selection functions, we tend to use logistic regression. There's some reasons to, to use weighted logistic regression, whereas step selection functions, we use conditional logistic regression. Okay, so those are two general approaches to modeling the data. Um, what might cause and what, why might we be interested in among animal variability? Well, there's all kinds, you guys know this stuff much better than me. Um, there can be differences between males and females and how they use habitat. Environmental factors can play a strong role. Um, density, de density dependence can be re really important in terms of habitat use and there's a long theory um, of um, a lot of work that's looked at and considered the effects of density on habitat use. Can depend on the rest of the predator-prey community. And there might be gen genetic components that um, certain individuals may behave very differently depending on their, um, their, their genome. Why do we care? Well, we might want to know what's the impact of the environment or genetics on habitat use patterns. We may want to relate habitat selection to fitness. We might want to understand um, whether individuals within the same species actually have individual niches. So whether um, individuals might specialize in very different sort of behaviors. And lastly, if we just pool all our data, we might miss really important patterns that we see when we can look at individuals when we know individuals are doing very different things. One other thing to consider that um, I think a lot of people don't actually consider when they fit these models is this whole idea of a functional response. Okay, so these, again, these parameters really reflect 
how much we use the environment and, and characteristics at our, our used locations relative to available locations. And we tend to have uh, infer that we have important predictors, we have preference for certain conditions. When we're using, we see those conditions show up more in our used locations than available locations. But what about a resource like water? Something that you might need in a constant amount, okay? So I think we're all told, I, I think it's like we're supposed to drink eight cups of water a day, something like that. I'm from Minnesota, there's 10,000 lakes. If you compare how much water I drink, eight cups, relative to the amount of water that's available, if I'm willing to drink out of all of our lakes and everything, what is it gonna look like? It's gonna look like um, I really am trying to avoid water, right? My use of water is gonna be much less than what's available to me. Whereas if I'm out in the desert and I may manage to have eight glasses of water and I have very little water around me, it's gonna look like I really prefer water. So for some characteristics, um, we might expect something like this, that if we were actually going to collect data from individuals in very different landscapes, some that have a lot of water around it, some that have very little water around it, our coefficients may um, really depend on that availability. So when we're in a landscape with a lot of water, we might have coefficients that we estimate that are negative. And when we're in a landscape where there's not much water, we might expect we get a very positive coefficient. And at some point, water might be limiting, right? And then it really becomes important. We might have something completely different. So um, this is an important thing that I, I don't think is always considered, is just the, how, how different resources might impact our use. Um, but it has, I mean, it has shown up in the literature a fair bit. This paper back in 1998 pointed it out that habitat use patterns depend on habitat availability. And they also made the important point that we need to be thinking about interactions. So individuals might spend more time foraging if they have, res if they have areas that they can escape to that are close by. So the effect of one environmental char characteristics may really depend on all those other characteristics that are available to the animal. And these authors um, actually found a fair bit of empirical support for these functional responses. They developed an approach for accounting for habitat availability in these models um, by essentially thinking about these coefficients and how they might change with availability of the um, resource in the landscape available to an animal. So here you see this sort of, um, the habitat use depends a lot on availability. One of my colleagues, Jason Mathiopoulos at University of Glasgow, extended this approach to allow considering of both um, categorical variables, quantitative variables, multiple variables in a model, um, and trying to think about why these coefficients or, or think about how we can model variability in coefficients and arguing that we can do that by including predictors that capture the amount of availability in the landscape. So um, when I say moments of availability, I mean things like statistical mo moments like the mean and the variance. So maybe capturing the mean amount of some resource within, say, an animal's home range and using that as a predictor. Um, interactions between these moments and then thinking also about adding sort of a random component. So having random coefficient models. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the last part of the talk. So this requires data. Um, from individuals that are in very different landscapes. And one of the points here is I think we can learn a lot if we actually can capture data from animals in very different landscapes because we would expect their coefficients in these sort of models to, to depend on those larger landscape characteristics. Okay, so this random coefficient model, what does it mean and what are some of the ways that we can um, try and model among animal variability? Um, two approaches that I'm going to talk about a little bit today, one very simple, one a little bit more complex. Um, one, the simplest approach would be just fit a model to each individual animal. Capture the coefficients in a data set and treat those summaries as kind of individual summaries for each of those individuals and then explore patterns within those coefficients. So sort of a, a two-step approach where you um, summarize an individual's data in terms of these coefficients and then do statistics on those statistics. A second approach is to fit mixed, mixed effect models that um, capture that variability all in one place. So they have one model that does all this together. And visually, I like to, you know, obviously think of two step, whoop, the two-step approach is you get all these different estimates, and then once you have them, you're gonna, you're gonna try and explore 
um, patterns in them, whereas the mixed effect model is trying to do it all at once. So in terms of resource selection functions or step selection functions, here's that, that piece that's important that summarizes um, the importance of all these different predictor variables. If we fit a model to each individual, we can think of each individual having its own coefficient. So now I've got an index on these parameters that says each of these resources, risks, or conditions will get a different coefficient for each individual animal. Okay, so each, each beta represents a different resource, risk, or condition, and the index I represents the individual. And then we can do statistics on those statistics. So to help think about how this might work, I'm going to look at a small data set of Fisher from upstate New York that were collected by Scott LaPointe. Um, and to kind of hit on one of the points from yesterday's talk, archiving your data, making it available to people. Scott made these data available in MoveBank, and I don't know how many extra citations he's gotten, but people use these data all the time. So um, again, another message to when you're done, archive your data, make them available to others. You'll get a lot more citations and potential collaborations. Um, we use this data set in some of the workshops that we do. Uh, there's examples online, so if you're interested in, in, in some of this stuff, um, I can point you back to this uh, URL where we have a lot of the code and examples and things. But we're going to consider three different covariates here. Um, elevation, population density, and whether the location fell in forest or non-forested habitat. Um, with the AMT package and this, these workshops we do, um, we've got examples of how you can do this in, I don't know if you count this as two lines of code or like eight lines of code, but um, I'm not a tidyverse person in R, but if you are, um, it can be, you can do this really quick. And Johannes is, is, has set up the AMT package to do these things so it all works well with the tidyverse and you can fit models to individual animals very quickly, pull off those coefficients, and then end up with something like this very simply. So you end up with a data frame where each row is a different individual. So e here we have eight different individuals. Um, here we appended things like the amount of data associated with each individual. You could um, append other sort of individual level characteristics, for example, the sex of the fisher. And then we have a separate coefficient for each individual animal. So this represents um, the importance of elevation to each of these eight different fisher. From that, we can do anything. So once you get to this point, you're only limited by your statistical knowledge, essentially. What can you do to, to think about what might be influencing those coefficients? You could easily look to see if males and females have different coefficients. So um, you could estimate the mean for females and the mean for, for males and see if they, they're different, calculate confidence intervals, do simple t-tests, essentially. Um, you could relate the coefficients to different characteristics of the individual animals. You could calculate their variance as a measure of how variable are these effects across individuals. There are some issues here. It's not perfect. Um, if you just calculate the variance of these coefficients, you're ignoring any sort of sampling error that's associated with those estimates. So you, this is a case, like yesterday I said, sometimes doing the wrong thing if you understand it well and you know the sort of bias that, it, that is associated with the wrong method can sometimes be okay. If you look at the variances here, you're going to know that they're too big. Um, and that can be an issue. It's not perfect, but it is a, a simple starting point. You could plot coefficients against availability to explore functional responses. So again, this is a nice, simple way that's very exploratory that you could apply um, to think about among animal variability. Uh, it could often be a useful starting point for an exploratory analysis. One nice thing is there's a little bit fewer assumptions. So when we, get, when we talk about mixed effect models, we're going to have additional assumptions about how those different coefficients relate to each other across different individuals. We're not making any assumptions here about that. Um, you could potentially use something like a bootstrap for inference to resample, co resample individuals um, to, to quantify uncertainty. Um, the paper I mentioned yesterday I think is a really good one for thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of this approach, you know, something simple. And in the context of step selection functions, there actually are a couple papers out there 
that have proposed this as an approach. And actually, they do, they do everything in a little more rigorous way than I presented it. So they actually account for that sampling variability when they estimate variance components, so the variance of these different coefficients. Um, and up until very recently, this was probably the main approach for being able to fit mixed effect models um, to in this step selection sort of framework. So where you're using conditional logistic regression and you want to allow for parameters to vary from individual to individual. Uh, and there's an R package for implementing that two-step approach. Well, what are mixed effect models? Many of you may be familiar with them, may use them. I know when I teach my grad level class and I get to this point and students know that I really expect them to understand things beyond just pushing buttons and getting answers, but to be able to interpret what a standard error is, be able to interpret these things. People are much more reluctant. You know, I say, how many people have fit a mixed effect model? Hands go up, how many people understand it? And they get to about, you know, maybe down here. Um, there's a lot of ways to think about, well, what are random effects? And I know when I took statistics, some of the discussion was, um, are the, in, the, the different, say, clusters, let's think of individuals here, were they a random selection of individuals from a larger population? If so, treat them as random effects. If not, treat them as fixed effects. Um, another consideration was often, are you trying to generalize to the population, say, here in the, the population of individuals? If so, treat them as a random effect. If you're only interested in those eight fish, or treat them as fixed effects. Um, to me, the, the most helpful way of thinking about mixed effect models and communicating this is that random effects um, essentially have one extra layer on top of them that basically says all of these parameters um, are related in some way. They come from a common distribution. So we're essentially going to assign a distribution to those parameters we've estimated. In the context of the models we're thinking about are in regression models. We could think about random intercept models. So you could think of each individual having its own intercept. Um, you can do that with fixed effects or random effects. You could include animal ID in a, in a regression model and you would get different intercepts for each animal. That's not a mixed effect model. A mixed effect model would say those, on top of that, those intercepts come from a common statistical distribution, usually a normal distribution. We can have random intercepts and random slopes. So intercepts might vary by individual, and the effect of elevation or population density itse itself may also vary by individual. Those are the sort of models that make sense, that we're really interested in, right? So if you're interested in functional responses, you want to let those coefficients each have their own effect, right? Okay, so coming back to this example, the starting point would be really simple, similar to that two-step approach. Each individual has its own set of coefficients, describing the importance of those different predictor variables, but we're gonna add one other layer. So we will assume that those coefficients come from a normal distribution with some overall mean effect, and then we'll have a variance covariance matrix that the diagonal will describe the variance in those coefficients across different individuals. And the off diagonal will describe relationships, so how those different parameters co-vary. Um, and the way I like to think about that, if parameters co-vary, you could think about an, a fissure that has a large coefficient, say, for population density. Will it have a large coefficient also for forest? So if so, if those coefficients are related, then those covariances are going to be something other than zero. If each individual gets assigned coefficients individually, then they won't covary, and you'll just have variances. So I like to think about it as a fisher could walk through the door, and we could either throw three different parameter estimates at that fisher, three different parameters, one for population density, one for forest, one for elevation, and a fisher would get all three of those at the same time because when it tends to get a high value of one parameter, it gets a high or low value of the other. Or we could have each fisher walk in independently and give it an elevation coefficient, make them all walk out, walk back in, and each one would get a forest coefficient, and so on. If that, in that latter case, those um, covariance terms would be zero. So this is important because if we don't have a lot of animals and we're trying to estimate variances and covariances, we may not be able to do that very well, okay? 
So the examples that I'm going to illustrate down the road, we're actually going to assume these things are independent. We just don't have enough animals to really estimate all those variances and covariance as well. Some advantages of this approach, we get both individual estimates and we get the summaries at the population level at the, in, a, in a single model. We can actually borrow strength across individuals, and I'll illustrate this a little bit more in a, here in a minute. We can take, because we're saying all of these individuals are related in a certain way, they all have parameters that come from a common distribution, knowing something about one individual should tell us something about another individual. So we can actually borrow strength by borrowing information across individuals when we're estimating individual specific parameters. And we can estimate the mean coefficients and their variance while accounting for sampling variability all in one step. So this idea of shrinkage and borrowing strength, um, I think it's, this is a nice illustration of it. We can think about this lower panel as what we would get if we fit a model to each individual fissure. The solid dark green lines represent our point estimates. The, the distribution represents our uncertainty. Um, here's the mixed effect model. We're assuming all of those, param all of those parameters follow this common normal distribution. And if we get a value that's way out in the tail, and we also have quite a bit of uncertainty with it, we'll say that that's probably not a very good estimate. We'll actually pull that estimate back towards the overall mean. So we're going to use all of this other information that says, you know, most of the fissures parameters are closer to here to say this one's probably um, estimated a little bit too high. Let's bring it back a little bit. Okay. And the amount of, of this um, shrinkage towards the overall mean will depend on, on the variability across individuals as well as this level of uncertainty associated with any individual estimate. The disadvantage is, well, we have more assumptions. Now we're assuming that the, our parameters are normally distributed. We should ideally check that to see if that's reasonable. We have a lot of added complexity. So even just to fit this model, to calculate the likelihood, we have to use numerical integration techniques. So this can be really challenging. Um, it can potentially be harder to, to understand and communicate. Um, and so there are, you know, there, are, it's, there are some challenges potentially involved with it. In terms of what's out there for fitting mixed effect models, well, there's lots of approaches, lots of software that'll let you fit logistic regression models with random um, coefficients, random intercepts, random slopes. A popular approach is the GLMER approach in LME4. In terms of thinking about how you could implement a mixed effect model for step selection functions, um, there's not a lot of great choices out there. Um, there is a, a package called COXME that was developed for survival analyses, and it turns out that the likelihood for a COX proportional hazards model is identical here, so that you could take advantage of that. This is really slow, especially if you have a lot of strata. And here we have a different um, stratum for every used location. So if you've got a big GPS data set, this is just not going to work. And I've had, I've had people say, I've tried this and I just gave up. Um, and then there's the two-step approach that I mentioned. There's one potential issue with that in that if you've got, you have to be able to fit your model to every single individual. And so if you've got something like a categorical um, predictor and one of your individuals doesn't encounter all of the levels of that categorical predictor, you're not going to be able to fit a model to that individual and this approach will fail. Okay, so you won't be able to estimate all the coefficients for individuals that don't encounter all the different um, habitat types in a, of a categorical variable. So this led to a collaboration with uh, Stephanie Muff here who's at Norwegian University of Science and Technology was at University of Zurich. And again, Johannes uh, Signer, who's at University of Göttingen, um, where we wanted to first just look to see how are random effects used in these different types of studies. And then secondly, we wanted to try and develop a computationally efficient method for fitting step selection functions with random effects. So how could we do that conditional logistic regression model where we have random slopes? So the first thing we did was go back and look at the literature. There's um, random effects were proposed for habitat selection studies over 10 years ago. Um, this paper by Gillies et al. I know a little bit about this because I know 
Um, I know a few of the authors, they were grad students at the time, and I, my understanding is their advisors all said, go, this stuff's just coming on the scene. Software for fitting mixed effect models were around for maybe three, four years at the time, maybe, maybe five years at the time, and they said, go figure this stuff out and write a paper, and they did, which is pretty impressive, I think. Um, a year or two ago, this had been cited almost 500 times, so it did get a lot of traction. Um, we looked at the papers citing this paper and looked to see if they fit mixed effect models and what they did. The majority of those studies fit mixed effect models where they only included a random intercept, no random slopes, which to me is really interesting. This comes back to the, the point that I made that um, the intercept in these models really is not all that important. So to me, this, this, this was really eye-opening. Um, that intercept mainly depends on that ratio of used to available points. And if you actually, I've had people contact me and say, I'm trying to estimate this variance in the intercept, and it's coming out with an estimate of zero. I don't understand it. But they're using a, co a constant ratio of used to available points. And when you do that, that variance among individuals is probably going to be pretty small. It can still vary because it's not quite just the ratio of used to available points. But um, it's probably not doing exactly what you think it's going to do. Uh, this doesn't let you look at variability among individuals in that most important piece, which is that functional response. So why are those predictors different, having different effects in different landscapes or with different individuals? And then the other thing is you can make a pretty good argument that the standard errors are probably too small for most of those coefficients in these models. So if you only include a random intercept, you're not necessarily accounting for all of the issues with um, non-independence. And this is a really nice paper in my mind where they demonstrate this. They show um, when you've got covariates that actually vary within a cluster, within an individual. So something like the amount of habitat I'm using at different time points. So my locations have different elevations. Um, that you should really be thinking about including random slopes with those sorts of models. So to demonstrate this, we took some data um, in this resource selection function package in R, and it's mountain goat data. I think there were 10 different individuals uh, fit a series of three models. So a model here, GLM, just a logistic regression model with two predictors, aspect and elevation. Um, we fit a model that had a random intercept. That's this term. And then we fit uh, a model that had a random intercept plus random coefficients for aspect and elevation. And what do you notice when you go from the model that assumes everything's independent to the model with just a random intercept? You really don't have a big effect on the confidence intervals at all. But once you account for um, variability among individuals and their random slopes, you start to see, well, you don't, you've got a lot more uncertainty in those um, those, the effects of those different covariates. So this kind of supports that, that paper that suggests just including a random intercept may not be, be sufficient. The other part of this paper is trying to think about, well, how could we develop a method for fitting um, step selection functions with random effects? And Steffi came up with this really uh, clever idea that she had seen applied in, in other situations where essentially we can think of um, there's a, an equivalence between a Poisson model where you have a separate intercept for each stratum. So if you allow each use point to have a separate intercept, there's actually an equivalence between a Poisson model with, um, with those intercepts and this conditional logistic regression model. You get the exact same estimates, the exact same standard errors. The downside is, um, again, we have a different intercept for every use point. That would be really challenging to fit. Lots of extra parameters that we wouldn't want to estimate. So the trick here is we could treat those as random effects, but we have to do something a little bit different. We have to treat them as random effects, but we have to, we have to fix the variance so that it's really big because we don't actually want any sort of shrinkage in this case. We don't want individual intercepts to be shrunk towards some overall mean because this equivalence between the Poisson model and the conditional logistic regression model only holds when you have a separate intercept for each of these stratum and they're not informing each other. Um, you can easily do that in a Bayesian context. 
Or in a frequentist context, you can do that using the GLMM TMB package. Um, you can fix this, this um, variance of the intercepts at something really big. And what that does is it, it effectively fits the model as though it has separate intercepts for each of those stratum. And in the paper, we have a simulation study that shows that this works quite well. It only works if you treat those, um, the variance of those intercepts as something that's large um, and with a fixed variance. If you actually fit it in a complete mixed effect model, you get biased estimates. Um, I'm not going to go through that simulation study for time. I'm just going to continue with this example a little bit with the Fisher data to compare sort of this naive two-step approach and the mixed effect approaches. So again, thinking about this um, data set where we have eight individuals, we have these three different predictors. Um, thinking about a two-step approach where we might fit models to each individual animal and summarize those co coefficients versus uh, fitting a mixed effect model. So I'll look at estimates of the individual coefficients, their mean, and their variance across different animals. So here's, here's what we get if we fit a logistic regression model to each individual or a logistic regression mo model with random coefficients. The individual fits are in gray. The estimates from the mixed model are in uh, sort of orange. There, there are actually two lines here that represent the mean from both approaches. So the mean across different animals. And our three panels represent those three different co covariates. Um, and we see we get really similar results. We get almost identical results if we fit estimates fit models to each individual animal um, or if we fit models with this mixed effect approach. And if we look at just a naive estimate of variance, of, they're too big, like I said, because we're ignoring sampling variability. Um, but the bias is not huge. Um, there's not a huge effect here. So what happens when we do the same thing in a step selection function? Um, well, let me, let me step back. Why do I think, wh why are these things so similar? Well, I think it's because we have lots of data. Uh, we're assuming all of those observations are independent, so there's no real need to borrow information from across individuals because our coefficients are estimated well, so there's little shrinkage. So in some ways, this two-step approach is a nice, simple way to think about the problem. Um, and again, two-step approach with bootstrapping might be a reasonable approach because we don't have to assume that all those observations within an individual are independent. We might just think about the individuals themselves being independent. When we do the same sort of comparison with the step selection functions, we see a very different sort of result. So here we've got um, a few estimates when we apply the model to each individual animal that get shrunk way down toward the overall mean. Okay? And this is that shrinkage effect that I mentioned before. Um, you see it again here. Um, and, and in this case, our naive estimates of variance are quite a bit bigger. Okay. So what, what's going on there? We can actually, so the, to, to dig a little bit deeper, I plotted each of those individual estimates along with confidence intervals from, from the fits of the models to each individual. Um, with the resource selection functions, the variability in the coefficients is large relative to the uncertainty with any given estimate. So the model's going to say, you know what, I really think this estimate is really far away from all the others. Right? There's a lot of variability among animals. My estimate of this coefficient is fairly precise. I'm not going to change it much. Whereas in the step selection function, we've got much bigger estimates of uncertainty associated with the individual fits. Part of this is um, we've gone from independent locations to independent transitions. And one thing I, I kind of glossed over is that we're assuming we're, we, we have to have um, a constant sampling interval. So here we've actually dropped locations where we, we've had missed locations in between. So we've only looked at steps that are, say, an hour apart. So we have less data to work with. We've got more uncertainty. In this case, we've get a, we get an estimate that's quite a bit away from everything else and a lot of uncertainty. And the mixed effect model is going to say, no, I'm going to bring this much back towards the overall mean. These coefficients all come from a common distribution. So I'm going to use the information from the other individuals to, to modify that estimate. Um, this one gets modified quite a bit just because there's not much variability across individuals. So again, the model's going to say, well, all individuals are doing really similar things. So it's unlikely that this one's got a coefficient that's so far away from everything else. 
So I think there's some benefits. There's probably some beneficial shrinkage here, right? So there are cases where, you can, where borrowing strength can be informative. Another nice thing is that we're able to get estimates of variance parameters that aren't biased. So there's some advantages to the mixed effect approach. Um, stepping back a little bit in terms of, again, thinking about my philosophy and how I approach problems, I think we need both simple and more sophisticated methods so that you know, people with different skill levels can, can work with their data and, and apply methods that they fully understand. Um, sometimes specifying appropriate mixed effect models can be hard. They can be hard to fit, whereas fitting models to individual animals is really nice, quick, easy, fast, which can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. So again, like yesterday, you can quickly explore all kinds of patterns, right? And whether those patterns are really meaningful, you have to be a little bit careful, okay? But as an exploratory approach, this can be a powerful approach. The other thing to kind of note that I spoke about quite a bit yesterday is, you know, quantitative ecologists get paid for developing more sophisticated methods. That's what we get um, judged by. And so you, you do see increasingly sophisticated methods, and I think that's important. A lot of those are real advantages that let that you do more appropriate things with data. But we also need research from people that help guide biologists to an appropriate method and knowing when things are the complexity is needed. So again, kind of highlighting that quote from yesterday, since all models are wrong, scientists must be alert to what is importantly wrong. We need to know when we need the more sophisticated approaches. So um, the, the last slide, to kind of summarize up some of the opportunities, I think, for research in, that, in this overall theme of when is the complexity warranted, um, I think we need to think a little bit about independence with resource selection functions. Um, those locations within individual are not independent. And, and fitting a logistic regression model assumes that they are. And I think there'll be some work done with this in this area in the next couple of years. Um, thinking about how many individuals we need to estimate coefficients and also covariability among different parameters. So um, with only eight individuals, we assume that coefficients for population density were independent from coefficients for forest, say. Um, is that reliable? Um, what sort of impact does that have? Is it okay to assume turn angles and step lengths are independent? So I'm working with a, um, a colleague in Switzerland where we're trying to develop statistical models that capture correlation between angular distributions and step lengths. And it turns out it's not so easy to do that, but there are approaches to do that. Um, and then the next question is going to be, is, is, it, is that useful? And when is it most useful? How do we incorporate longer-term dependencies? Um, and how do, we, how do we account for changes in animal movement and habitat selection pa patterns that change throughout a day and across different behavioral states and those sorts of things? So I think there's lots of opportunity. Um, I didn't mean to go quite, quite this long, but hopefully there's still at least a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, Sarah. example of the two-step approach where you're comparing coefficients from models created per individual, um, each of those have their own intercepts. And so even though the intercept is not biologically meaningful, it does slightly change the interpretation of the coefficients so you can't directly compare them. Is that, is that true or are there some cases when we just ignore that? I think these are a little different situation, these models, because essentially to do it, well, the inter there's, only, there's not an intercept in a conditional logistic regression model. So this really only applies to logistic regression models. And there that intercept, ideally, we would just fit it in the homogeneous Poisson process model to begin with. Um, and, and so um, the intercepts are important to fit within that approach, but they don't capture anything meaningful, is how I would argue. Um, I don't know if I've addressed your, I'm trying to think of how to address your actual question. Um, so yeah, it, it, I think I'd, I'd say I kind of agree with what you said. You need them in there and you need to allow them to vary from individual to individual. But the focus, the biological focus should be on the variability and the, the coefficients that are tied to the different uh, environmental covariates. Okay. And you can make direct comparisons between those coefficients between individuals, even though the intercepts associated yes. with them are Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Come. Yes. Easy. So I'm, I've been messing around a bit with um, hidden Markov models lately, and I've been very 
I'm very taken with them, but I'm also pretty naive to them. Um, but I'm impressed by their capacity to capture these transitions among behavioral motifs. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what potential you see in, in um, or wh where you think the interface should be between the utility of step selection functions versus um, pin markup model and type approaches, or, you know, if I'm just being way too no, I think that's a really interesting question because, you know, I mean, a lot of this is just kind of looking at average behaviors. Unless you're interacting, there are a few interesting applications with using, say, like um, sine and cosine uh, patterns interacted with covariates to say my, the importance of forest is, is important in the morning but not the afternoon. So you can let the coefficients essentially vary within a day. Uh, you don't see that a lot, but I think that's really important and often very interesting. But it's thinking about individuals changing their behavior th just um, throughout the day. Uh, you know, hidden Markov model is one approach to capturing those transitions. And I know you can model, uh, you can model the importance of habitat covariates in influencing transitions. And I think you're in that same, similar boat. Um, I've had a few just uh, email conversations with Roland Lang. Langrock, um, who does a lot of hidden Markov models. And we were discussing this. There's trade-offs. You can fit those models, but they're really computationally challenging to have those covariates in there, especially with big data sets. And again, this is where, this is the sort of thing I, I get excited with because I'm not, my, my background's, uh, I'm not a, not a theoretical statistician, so kind of doing that, I'm, I'm very interested in that applied focus and how to get that answer in a robust sort of way. And to me, one, one sort of uh, starting point might be to fit the hidden Markov models and then to fit these, fit different sort of step selection models to those different behavior, to data stratified by behavioral states. And then if you want to account for the full range of uncertainty, you could think of like something like a bootstrap where you resample your, you, you account for the hidden Markov models and you propagate that through, which again, then that's going to be really highly computationally challenging maybe, but um, it's a simply, simple starting point. And I think, I think you could potentially get some leverage there. I don't have a whole lot of back. I mean, I understand what hidden Markov models do, and I just haven't worked with an, with them enough in a different in different applied cases to. Yeah, I was just struck by like they catch the same. I mean, they're not going for they're trying to describe effects of describe differences in slope coefficients, for example, as a function of fixed effects as opposed to random effects, but they have this same, you know, kind of gestalt to them of trying to allow relationships to vary depending on thing X. And so there, I can see similarities, but I'm trying to. Yeah, put them all together. <laughs> I think the big thing there is you have a latent variable that's defining the classification here versus, versus knowing we're modeling variability among individuals versus trying to, trying to interpret what those states are in terms of some sort of latent variable that we don't measure. How? So I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned kind of this two-step approach, and, and I've taken that two-step approach several times. And, and what we usually start doing is use inverse variance weights when you calculate, for example, the mean across the field. Yeah. And you weight, but because our models give us back standard error, estimate for those parameters. What do you think about that, and how far is that from the mixed effect approach? In the sense that it takes, it, it takes into account some of the I think it's probably pretty quite reasonable. I think actually the the example I had, you would probably get very similar approaches, right? Um, when you think think of these means look very different, but if I did a weighted mean, they'd probably be very similar, because these points that are way off are also have huge uncertainty, and if we accounted for that, we'd probably get means that are very similar. Yeah, I think it's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were your inla fits comparable to your fits under other under the ML? Yeah, they were really similar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's another approach. I mean, again, uh, I've had people say, "Well, I'd be really excited about using inla," and I think inla is great for myself. 
I've got limited time, and, and I can understand how to fit within love, but then it's all the other things I want to do after the fact, and I have to spend a lot of time thinking about how do I summarize the posterior? How do I do these things? So again, I think part of it is having tools that you're comfortable with um, to work with that you really understand. This is a big part of it. Thank you.